Let's take a look back at the greatest era, the greatest decade of professional wrestling, the 1970s. Before I get to that, I'm not sure who it was in the comments. I had made a comment on a video a long time ago that before Adrian Adonis had passed away, he got rid of that stupid, adorable gimmick and went back to the black leather. He lost a ton of weight and he was going to, he was preparing to make another comeback through the States as such. And unfortunately he was killed. And I said, I have a photo of him in a Japanese magazine, um, but I couldn't find it uh, of his last match in Japan as he was leaving to do a tour. Uh, outside of Japan, uh, his last match, they took some photos and they had a poster of him uh, with all the leather. And it took me forever to find it. I couldn't remember which issue it was, so it's hard to fit it in there. I'm gonna do the best I can to fit the poster in there. But here is Adrian back uh, with all the leather and a ton of weight has lost. You can see in the stomach and also in the face, uh, well over 100 pounds have come off of him at this point. Uh, across the bottom here, you can't see it's written really small. It says Adrian Adonis, the return of the black leather. And uh, here is that poster that I said I had. Actually, I thought it was a photo. I didn't realize it was a poster um, of him and his uh, one of his last appearances, actually the last appearance uh, in Japan. Um, this is also the same issue that's covering Bruiser Brody's death. Another issue, uh, I'm not sure, if, I don't think I've shown this before because I haven't found this magazine. It was in another pile. Uh, this is August's issue of um, Baseball Magazine. And uh, this is the cover of it. And it goes into detail about also about Bruiser's death. Again, it's got you know, photos of Bruiser uh, in the casket. Um, at the funeral and some of the wrestlers who were there at the viewing uh, in Puerto Rico and back. Uh, so it's in this issue. Sorry to get back to you so long with that information. It took me forever. To, I couldn't remember what issue it was in. I have so many. You guys know my collection by now. And uh, it just took me forever to find that. So this video is going to be jam-packed of nothing but the 1970s, starting from the 1970 all the way up. Uh, through 1979 and all the happenings in between. Um, one of the great things about the wrestling magazines of the 1970s were all the bloody covers. Uh, there were just time capsules that instantly bring us nostalgia and, and the, the, the shock of the, of the cover and how it sucked you in and, and you just wanted to read on more about who was this guy, what happened to this guy. It was a fantastic selling point. And the 70s were notorious for the rivers of blood that were on the cover of the magazine. So let's take a look at some of them. And early on, Bobby Heenan was on a ton of wrestling magazines bloodied up. Uh, Many of the covers you see Heenan in are repeated covers, uh, and it started from this match in a cage with Dick the Bruiser on the cover of Strangle, uh, Wrestling News Strangleholds Edition in 1973. Uh, the match goes back earlier than 73, uh, but here is the, one of the matches that started off Bobby Heenan uh, looking a bloody disaster here in this issue in November 1970 uh, on the cover. and. Uh, one of the most uh, common, popular ones was this one. You know, my God, uh, what happened, Bobby? What happened to your face? And I uh, read the story inside of what happened. This is quite a rare uh, issue and very expensive uh, for some reason. Uh, if you can find it, <clears throat> many people um, bought these just because of the blood. I mean, it was just, just a, such a cool cover. There weren't even necessarily wrestling fans uh, would just drawn to these kind of covers. There's another shot of Bobby here on December of 72, the wrestler. You'll see this photo a lot, reused over and over several times because it was such a hot selling piece. Uh, everyone gravitated towards that. And every one of these issues with Bobby sold in the, in the dozens. Uh, there's another one from December 73 of the wrestler. <clears throat> and obviously this is my very first wrestling magazine that I have ever got in 1977. This is the one that started me uh, on my path and uh, this totally sucked me in as well. I mean, it grabbed me and uh, to this day, I still haven't let go with my collection and continuing on uh, April of 1975, Inside Wrestling. Uh, and to me, this will always be a extra special uh, magazine because it was my very first. Wrestling news again with Bobby posing on the cover with a very bloody face. What a shot that is. And also another rare one, hard to find. 
Bobby again with um, Baron Von Raschke, uh, most likely during the WWA Dick the Bruiser uh, territory days in 1972. <clears throat> again with Baron Von Raschke, uh, August of 1971, and also Bobby up at the top here, bloodied up. <clears throat> ben Strong, a rare publication that was not around for very long. Uh, some people thought that was Ray Stevens on the cover. Now that is Bobby Heenan on the cover, bloodied up. March of 75, great shot of Superstar who's not bloodied uh, on this cover. But Joe LaDuke was a great bleeder up in Montreal. Harry had a ton of his batches and uh, the family had the promotion. And this is November of 1973. Dick the Bruiser, once again, Sweet Hansen on the top with Rip Hawk, January 75. <clears throat> Captain Lou Albano in 75, very bloody cover early classic shots of these guys and what sold the magazine cover stanley weston loved the bloody covers uh sports review with um uh, rivera on the cover with dino bravo wrestling can the slaughter be stopped <clears throat> they got a bloody superstar graham in the far right uh bobby heenan below and uh terry funk completely covered Look at that face. I mean, my goodness. Bloodbath uh, in Chicago. I think it says somewhere. For, yeah, right here. Um, March of 72. Great cover. Always love this cover. Uh, when you're, you're a kid looking at this, you're like, is this guy, is he going to jail for murder? I mean, look at this. You know, it's just unreal. <clears throat> a very early bloody shot of Superstar Graham in 1972, October. I'm sorry, is that 73? Yeah, it's kind of smudged off. It's I think it's 73. That must be because um, Jack wins the title. So 73, wrestler, October, and uh, superstar. Look at a bloody mess here. <clears throat> the Sheik and John Tolis wars that took place in the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles, August of 72. A few more of these bloody covers. September 72 with uh, two uh, covers of T Terry Funk. At one time, a ridiculously hard magazine to find. This actually took me a couple of years to find this. Uh, it was all of a sudden, it's just everywhere. And uh, for years, it was nowhere. It's, it's really strange. Uh, magazines come out like that. It, it, sometimes they're easy to find. And then another time, it could take you years to find it before one pops up. You just never know. March of 1970. I was beginning to think it didn't exist until finally, here it is. Uh, <clears throat> another shot of Bobby Heenan on July of 1974 with Don Leo getting the main shot. The Sheik in July of 71. This is also a repeated edition of this issue for October 71. For those who recognize this, I explain it in other videos. The Sheik biting the head of uh, Dory Funk Sr. <clears throat> a very bloody Blackjack Mulligan and uh, Harley Race, a great magazine cover and this is later on of March 1979 later on in the decade and the blood was still flowing tremendously throughout the entire decade of the 70s December 73 Victor Rivera with the America's title from NWA Los Angeles territory Stan Stasiak on the bottom also bloodied up <clears throat> and that'll be it for not it for the bloody issues, but just the ones that I had pulled out to show some of the more bloodied issues of the 1970s and uh, how the matches were and how the magazines would totally exploit that and make a dollar off of it because the fans loved it. In my personal opinion, um, it, it wouldn't be the 70s without, without the chic, Ed Farhat, the, the real chic. Um, in, in my humble opinion, he is the greatest heel of all time. I don't think he'll ever be passed. I don't think anyone could ever be uh, a better heel uh, than he. Um, many people tried stealing pieces of what he had, and it just cannot be duplicated. He was the absolute best at being the heel that he was, and one of the best covers of the Sheik with his United States title, Detroit version, in June of 75 on an issue of Ben Strong. Absolutely love this magazine cover. 
I remember used to stare at it in the back issue section, hoping one day I could save up a dollar fifty so I could mail away and get a copy, and uh, certainly did uh, as I got a little bit older. And these are really hard to find. These Ben Strong's, especially this issue right here, is a tough one. So let's take a look at the Sheik. We'll go down memory lane a little bit and just see exactly why he was so great at what he did. Here's Wrestling Review, August of 1972. Another cover of The Sheik in February 1970. Now, for more in-depth look, a deeper dive at The Sheik, uh, check out our Rise of The Sheik video we did. We show every magazine cover he was on uh, from the first till his last. Um, this issue of Gong, December 1974, is showing his uh, first tour through Japan. Um, even though it's 1974, uh, it's covering a lot of the photos of him during his first tour. <clears throat> this issue uh, of The Sheik in wrestling um, uh, monthly, and once a weekly, I keep wanting to say weekly, uh, monthly pro wrestling. Uh, this is 1972, and this is The Sheik's first appearance, and he's taken on Sagaguchi. It's very interesting. Uh, and again, 1972, they were full color. I'm gonna, they gave us a really awesome poster. Uh, of the Sheik, a pull-out tri-folded poster of the Sheik with the with the bloody mouth, and uh, just incredible what they gave their fans. Um, the Sheik now is eating uh, his certificate after his very first match uh, in Japan because he won the title. He beat Sakaguchi for the national NWA National Heavyweight Championship on his very first match, and the fans were in complete shock. Here he is biting Sagaguchi's face, and here he is with his championship belt. Hard to see that. Wish they had a better shot of him with the belt. Hope I can't even really get it in there, but there he is with the national title. Uh, he would lose it back immediately to Sagaguchi, but there was some uh, great coverage of him during his first, not only his first tour, his first match, and it made the front cover of uh, weekly, uh, sorry, weekly, uh, monthly pro uh, wrestling in Japan, uh, October 1972's issue. Not bad, That's, that established him quick. He won with the pencil to the head and cheating, and that stuff didn't happen in Japan. They were honorable, uh, they were respectful, and they never see anything quite like the Sheik. And when he came out and won the title on his first match there, that really set the tone of who he was and what he was all about and how bloodied uh, Sakaguchi was after that match. Here's the Sheik once again, 1978 Falls Annual Edition Challenge in Harley Race for the NWA World Heavyweight title. This is an excellent uh, magazine. I show it, of course, in the Sheik video, and one of our, uh, our, our friends of the channel uh, brought up, that this, is this the issue? Actually, he told me, he reminded me, this is the issue I had all of the Sheik's um, facts of his wrestling career and photos. And I was like, you're absolutely right. And I should have made more mention to that. This is a great issue of Big Book of Wrestling, September of 72. And it's got a ton of uh, Sheik's uh, early years and uh, all his matches and his wins and his titles up until this point in 72. So if you're a Sheik fan, I certainly would search this one out. I'm not sure, I I've had it forever and ever. I don't know if it's hard to get or not. It, it could be, but it shouldn't be too much money. Um, the Big Book of Wrestling didn't sell, and Monthly Pro and, and those kind didn't sell as uh, much as like the Stanley Weston issues did, but uh, definitely a good one. Here's another one, Monthly uh, Wrestling March 75, where the Sheik's just hanging uh, by the ropes. <clears throat> Once again, the Sheik is um, bloodied up on the cover with Terry Funk now. Superstar Graham in the corner before a match with Dusty Rhodes at the Garden. The Sheik choking the life out of his opponent. Not quite sure who it is. Um, January 75 of Wrestling Monthly. Wrestling News Stranglehold uh, edition of uh, The Sheik and Bobo Brazil, who's had many classic uh, battles. You don't need me to tell you anything about The Sheik and Bobo. That's yeah, well documented. Another great magazine cover from Japan, The Sheik and Abdul the Butcher, both a bloody mess getting choked out uh, on the cover. Great magazine cover. I just, just an awesome looking cover. If you like gore, close ups, and brutality, that's the issue for you. Gung covered it the best in full color. 
This is a pro wrestling uh, annual. This is not attached to anything other than a sports magazine. They put out um, pro football annual, pro baseball annual. I don't think there was a boxing one. There was a pro hockey annual and wrestling was hot at the time and they put out a wrestling issue and they do a lot of covering the, the Sheik and Pedro Morales' title win against Bruno San Martino. This one also, not sure of the rarity of it. I've had it forever. Um, it, it could be rare because there wasn't many of these made. <clears throat> Rounding out uh, the Sheik, there was a couple of books that I have that are more like magazine picture books and they don't look like nothing. They're, they, they don't you know seem like nothing but the cover, not very attractive. I love these books. I can't say it enough. They're, uh, I got them on like a 50% off thing uh, on Amazon one day and it was like three dollars uh, come to find out that the full price was like seven <laughs> so I don't know I bought these when they first came out there's a couple of volumes one was with the Sabu I, I don't have that one shown here but I highly suggest these these are um, coming from the Sheik's Detroit uh, territory if you're a fan of the Sheik and Detroit wrestling big time wrestling these are great little magazines there was uh, two of these actually three but these are the two with the Sheik on the cover and um, Matt Memories of the Sheik, the original Detroit Terror. I would certainly look into Amazon and see if they still had them. Uh, they were very cheap. This is a wrestling review that came out uh, in a book form, but it's a magazine style because the pages are all magazine style and a little bit thicker than the magazine, but pretty much the same black and white. And it's a great time capsule, again, of capturing Detroit wrestling uh, with the Sheik. Uh, so, and that wasn't very expensive either. And the same goes for uh, Wrestling Review Presents this Saturday night. Detroit wrestling from 65 to 80 photo album. And it's got the Sheik and Pobo on the cover. Uh, cannot recommend any of these books. These are a little more expensive. These two books, the Review and the Saturday night. <clears throat> but the other ones are very, very cheap and well worth it. You know, handful of pages, but some great photos nonetheless. Something that's not talked about very often is the uh, tag teams in the 1970s. And unless you're from the Carolina Territory or you know, somewhere else, yeah, there, there, there weren't big on many tag teams, um, especially in the Northeast. Uh, there hardly was any, uh, and they didn't really get much not get much, they didn't get any play at all on the magazine covers. If they did, it would be a small little corner shot of, of somebody or in their team, and very rarely did a, a, a tag team um, appear uh, on a cover, especially champions on a cover of a magazine throughout the 70s, and it, it's quite a shame. And I did a video uh, on tag teams, and we cover a lot of the tag team championship belts, so check out that if you're into tag team wrestling just go back into the library and and look back a few months and you'll see the video on that um, this is wrestling review March of 1970 rookie of the year John L Sullivan John L Sullivan was was not getting very far and blended in with every other guy and how he made a cover of a magazine was was pretty bizarre in its own right because he was basically a, a well unknown um, John L. Sullivan later, just two years later, would go on to be one half and then eventually one third of the hottest tag team of the decade of the 1970s. One of the only tag teams to stay together for the, almost a full decade when they joined in 1972 all the way through uh, 1980. And that's the Valiant Brothers, Johnny and Jimmy Valiant. They would take on tag team titles everywhere they went. Here they are on the cover of April 1975, the wrestler with the Worldwide Wrestling Federation Tag Team Championship belts. They would hold that multiple times. Uh, they were heels, of course, and um, Inside Wrestling also covering the Valiant Brothers uh, on the cover uh, July 1975. I'm trying to see if this was the yeah, yeah, this is the one that this was win a date with the Valiants. You can send in and, and you can win a date with the Valiants, which is extremely uh, rare for a heel to come off and have a date with a fan because they were heels. But um, they did it and it was a gimmick that worked really well. And it goes into the other issues later on. The Valiants, like I said, held tag team titles everywhere they went. 
The first of which would be the WWA Dick the Bruiser's territory, and they would take the WWA World Tag Team Championship belts. And here is Johnny and Jimmy on the bottom with those titles. <clears throat> and uh, this is Wrestling Monthly, October 1974. They would hold those titles multiple times as well. And here is the lucky contestant who won the date contest with the Valiants. And here's pictures of their dates uh, inside. And just a cool thing to see uh, for a heel to do. Uh, and that's how popular they were. Uh, September 1970, the Valiants. They would hold tag team titles in Florida, the United States Tag Team Championships. They would hold the um, uh, Georgia uh, Tag Team titles. Um, throughout the NWA, a couple different other territories they were in. The, the names are all escaping me, um, the, but the WWF and also the WWA, very popular, very hot team. To, and teams really rarely stayed together long. You look at Tony Gurria here, and he would be losing the tag team titles with Dean Ho uh, to the Valiants. And um, they, uh, I think Tony had five times held the title with five different partners. So teams didn't stay together very long. They all always split up. Um, Chief J. Strombo with White Wolf, and he had a couple other partners in between. Uh, everyone changed and didn't stay, and the Valiant stayed. So that was a rare thing in itself, because tag teams weren't really that hot, but they were super hot. Um, here's the Strombo I was just speaking of uh, with Jimmy Valiant, very bloodied on the cover, with Superstar Graham on the bloody cover on the other side, October 75, Inside Wrestling. The Valiants taking on Andre the Giant down the bottom while they're in a war with the tag team champions of Strombo and White Wolf, who was later on Sheik Adnan El Casey in the AWA for May of 1977, The Wrestler. <clears throat> Valiant would have brawls with um, Bruno San Martino, uh, several bouts of in the WWF and also the, the WWA. And Bruno and Dick the Bruiser would lose the tag team titles because they were tag team champions in the WWA to the Valiant Brothers. And that feud would continue on uh, in the WWF. This is May of 75 with Bruno and a younger look, a different look of superstar Billy Graham here with the dark hair, dark mustache, and somewhat shaved up head, not real long hair. Different look, quite becoming for his 80s look later on but he did have that in 74 as well. Another shot with the Valiants, with Superstar Graham and Ivan Putski getting the main photo in Inside Wrestling October 74. I have an autographed copy of this and I can't find it, it's somewhere. Um, of Sports Review, it's autographed by uh, Jimmy Valiant and Johnny and is here he is coming off the top rope. This is Bruno San Martino that they're hitting in the back and um, one other one, I think. This is a, might be the last. Not one more. Uh, December '74. Uh, look what Bruno and Strombo did to the Valiants, and uh, like I said, they continued that war with Bruno with a great bloody shot of the two Valiants in the tag team title race. 1979-78 would introduce the third Valiant, um, Jerry Valiant, right here. And here is the first time all three are on a major cover of a, on a cover of a major magazine, November 1978 uh, or nine. I can't make it out. Again, it's I think it's nine. Uh, a wrestling guide with their captain, Lou Albano, manager, and they are now the tag team champions once again in 1979. Here is another shot on the bottom of them. In the bottom here, so you can see they went through 1972 through 79 as being a hot tag team, very, uh, uh, I, I don't wanna say underrated because they were tag team champions everywhere, underappreciated, under talked about, I guess you could say, long before the Freebirds were a team, before the Four Horsemen were a team, it was the Valiants were the team with Captain Lou and uh, they really tore it up as, as the major heel tag team of the 70s. And just wanted to showcase them because they are not talked about enough, if you ask me, great over-the-top, colorful uh, tag team of the 70s. <clears throat> Here is a shot of the unthinkable Bruno San Martino taking on Ivan Koloff in 1971 and Bruno San Martino losing that title 
to the pictured Ivan Koloff here, the night that shocked Madison Square Garden and shook up the world of professional wrestling when Bruno had lost. This is the back of a cover of a program that features Ivan Koloff defending the, his title February 1st, 1971 in Allentown, PA against Chief J. Strombo. And uh, just a rare shot of Ivan. No magazine made mention of it because he held it for just, just a couple of weeks. Uh, waiting in the wings to take the reins was going to be the new champion, the present Worldwide Wrestling Federation United States heavyweight champion Pedro Morales challenging for the WWWF title Ivan Koloff held title versus title another piece that's not mentioned very often it was a consolidation of the two titles and then we're going to do away with WWWF's United States belt this is your last look at that belt on the cover of a magazine, this one and the next one. This is uh, summer of 1971. Pedro Morales, the dawn of a new era, and it talks about Pedro winning. It also discusses um, Bruno losing the title. Wrestling Review uh, also covered it. Wrestling World covered it better. It was a much better magazine in the 70s than it was for Wrestling Review. But uh, Morales avenges Bruno, getting the pin um, on top. He's also with the Worldwide Wrestling Federation United States Heavyweight Championship belt. Another rare look at that belt. Uh, May of 1971's issue of Wrestling Review. May of 71, Pedro uh, on the cover story of the Stanley Weston issues for Inside Wrestling and The Wrestler. Next, covering both of these issues were May. I won uh, for my idol, Bruno San Martino. <clears throat> so that was the big news of 1971. It was huge. It was colossal. Bruno would go on to travel the country. Uh, a lot of that's discussed in the Bruno San Martino video that I made. So you can check that out for more in-depth detail. Um, he would travel th uh, to... Um, uh, uh, Dick the Bruiser's territory in Indianapolis. He would go out west to San Francisco. He would go to Los Angeles and wrestle in the, in the, uh, the Battle Royal out there and win it. Um, while the uh, Pedro took the reins for just a couple of years uh, in the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, getting us to 1971. This is the premier issue of Wrestling Monthly, issue number one. It'll say number one on the top. October 71, and it's our first time a magazine is showing us all three world champions, um, Pedro, who's the world champion who's wearing the U.S. belt, uh, Dory Funk now winning the title, I believe in 69 he won the NWA title against Kaniski, and uh, the unsung, unmentioned very often, except for Wrestling World magazine who covered Vern Gagne quite a bit um, in the AWA. This is also AWA's world title, slash in reality it's the Omaha heavyweight title that both he wore, uh, Butcher uh, Vashan wore when he was champion. Um, also, Crusher had wore that title. I don't know why they switched those titles out. They they wore they used the Omaha belt as well as the AWA belt. Um, they switched it out, and for no reason that I can think of why they had done that. Um, 1971, that is, correct? Yes. Now, it brings us to 1972, the next big thing to happen in 1972. New York fans go ape. Remember that quote? They go ape over girls. Um, the girls ban from Madison Square Garden for New York City. The ban was lifted for women wrestlers to uh, were allowed to compete. What a ridiculous ban that was, if anything, uh, of all the ban things that they had. Certain matches couldn't, they couldn't have masked wrestlers, they couldn't have, but not having women wrestle. I know Vince McMahon Sr. was not a fan of women wrestling, and uh, you didn't really, I know Bruno Sammartino wasn't a fan of women wrestling. I don't think Lou Thez was either. Um, don't quote me on Thez, I believe I, I, he said that. Um, October 72 issue is covering the very first women's match. Vicky Williams challenges the fabulous great Moolah for the world heavyweight title in the women's division. This was the NWA women's world title, by the way. Uh, there was no uh, WWF women's champion. It was the world women's champion, the same lineage as Mildred Burke. It was just, it was the NWA. And it wouldn't be the WWF belt uh, until Moolah sold it to him, to Vince Jr., that is, in, uh, I, remember, I forget the date. Um, I have it on one of my programs from The Garden, I believe. It was either 82 or 3. Um, 
Mola sold him the rights and McMahon started going by the WWF Women's Championship. Uh, but before that, it was the NWA, and of course, they were still affiliated uh, with the NWA for a number of years, on and off, the WWF was. <clears throat> uh, that's why they didn't use the world title name. Uh, the NWA had the rights to the world title name. Monthly, Wrestling Monthly, October 72, also covering uh, the girls wrestling in the garden. It says, girls wrestling in the garden for the first time. And it's got, this is a pretty common photo here. You see Vicki Williams uh, with the leg lock, Indian leg lock. It could be on the fabulous mullet on the bottom. And that photo was used on a bunch of magazine covers throughout the years of the monthlies, reviews, and guides uh, of magazine issues. Um, they all were all belong to the same uh, company, uh, Guide also. They're all by the same publisher. Uh, this is a little late to the story, but you know, they're nonetheless uh, December of 75 now. The match took place in 72. Fabulous Mula, uh, the night the Fabulous Mula broke the New York ban on women wrestlers. And full cover is inside this uh, issue here. And you see Mula wearing, it must be uh, close to Christmas time with her um, Christmas tree on her, uh, her trunks with the Ladies World title. Also making their debut in 1972, debut on the magazine covers, that is, not his debut in wrestling, was uh, Monster Rushimov, then Jean Ferre, and then Andre the Giant. Uh, before all that, he was the monster, and, and this is August 1972's issue. He was... Uh, Right around now, wrestling um, in the Canada, Montreal territory, I believe it is in 72. Um, we have a whole breakdown on Andre. Check out the Rise of Andre the Giant video back in our library for more on Andre. Here is his first magazine cover that kicked off a whirlwind of a career for him. <clears throat> One of his biggest uh, matches during the 70s was the uh, triple match with um, Don Leo Jonathan, uh, where they went all through Canada, starting out with 25,000 fans sell out to uh, 30 some odd to 40 plus during the third and final uh, matchup. This was a huge battle of the Giants. It was called October of 72, now going by Jean Ferre, seven foot four versus Don Leo, six foot nine. Um, uh, I love this magazine cover. It's just so telling of the times uh, back then. It just it just shows the 70s and, and uh, just magazine covers like this are just so it's two guys standing there like a poster, uh, as you would see before a fight, you know, and they're ready to do, do battle. Um, just I love these awesome looking style covers of the 70s, October of 72. This is uh, the continue the battle with Don Leo in 76. Uh, and when Don Leo made an appearance in the WWWF, he came in 75 and in 76 and uh, was replaced, not replaced, but he, he left as Bruiser Brody was coming in in 76 and have a series with uh, Andre. And um, he would also uh, battle uh, Bruno for the title. And uh, this is just another great shot. Not many covers uh, on the uh, have Andre and Don Leo together. I wish there was a lot more, but there's not. You know, I was a big fan of Don Leo. In 1974, Andre Monster Rushimov would make his Japanese appearance in Japan. And uh, this is his first Japanese cover of Andre uh, in Japan. He was huge in Japan. He would enter the 1974 IWA uh, tournament in the IWE, IWE uh, Wrestling Enterprises uh, and battle for the title for the IWA Japan. It gets confusing with the IWE, IWA and the different IWAs that were, would pop up later on. It originated in Japan. And this is a program to the night that he won that tournament. Uh, this is just the back showing the uh, IWE for the IWA tournament. Um, he won that tournament, which really put him on the map. And that he, they made a, sorry, they made a commemorative figure of his title win uh, in the Japanese uh, garb. And here he is with a couple of different heads and a replacement hands. One with the classic photo that was in Sports Illustrated of him hiding the 12-ounce beer, beer can in his hand. And uh, just a great shot of him. There's many of those photos of him in those in these magazines with the, the ribbon and the uh, championship that he had won in Japan. Uh, that pretty much put him on the map. 
and uh, everyone wanted a piece of Andre from this point. 1975, just several months after the, the tournaments and winning uh, the, in the IWA, he would appear in Los Angeles and enter the 20-man, $20,000 Battle Royal, and this would set off a chain reaction to come for Andre winning the most Battle Royals of anyone. Um, every time there was a Battle Royal, Andre was, was your winner. Except a couple that he didn't win, but by and large, he was the king of the Battle Royal, and it all started uh, with this 20-man uh, WWA Los Angeles Hollywood, uh, California uh, tournament, which was held every year, May of 1975. The wrestler uh, is covering uh, Andre's win. Great looking cover of a magazine. This Andre standing in the center above uh, uh, all as the heavyweight contender winning the battle royal. <clears throat> and in 76, Andre would come back uh, on the number one television show, Six Million Dollar Man. And um, if you're a young boy, and I'm sure some girls were fans too, especially with the Bionic Woman, um, The Six Million Dollar Man was the hottest show on television, and Andre uh, taking on the role as Bigfoot to take on uh, the uh, Lee Majors here um, just skyrocketed him, and he just went off in popularity. No CGI. I mean, look at that makeup and, and, and costume. Incredible. For 1976, come on, it's so realistic looking. You could pull that off today. It looks incredible. Um, but this really put Andre on the map. Uh, he became now sought after uh, by everyone and rightfully so. I thought I had one more with Andre. I guess I don't. Um, okay, so we jumped ahead a little bit. It was just following Andre up until 76, but we're still in 1972. Um, Pedro Morales now established well as the WWF champion and fans are buzzing. Bruno had come back into the territory and why doesn't Bruno get a title shot? This is a, uh, a one uh, rare magazine with Pedro on the cover. It's also signed by Pedro, one of my better pieces that I have autographed. <clears throat> um, and the match would take place. Here's a match. Here's a photo before the match, Pedro as the WWF champion and signed by Bruno together. Here is a program to that night, match of the century. This would be the first Shea Stadium show. Uh, you hear about Shea Stadium and you think of the 19, what was it, 1980 with uh, Anoki and, and uh, Ali on the pay-per-view and, and Bruno taking on uh, Stan Hansen. Um, but this was, that was the second one. This is the first match of the century, Pedro versus Bruno. Huge news throughout the wrestling world <clears throat> and every major magazine covered it. Wrestling Monthly covered it perfectly with what some say is the nicest looking wrestling magazine cover of all time. Wrestling Monthly, January of 1973's issue covering the uh, match with Bruno versus um, Pedro. The first time we had two uh, faces go up against each other in the WWF. That was something that th just did not happen and really doesn't happen since, uh, at least through my time of watching. And it's also signed by Bruno on the bottom. Here is the um, article. Um, at the end of the match for the uh, New York Post and uh, just a little article des describing the fans and how many fans turned out to watch it and, um, and uh, the results of it being a draw. <clears throat> also happening across the other side of the world in 1972, was the split from the, uh, the Japanese Wrestling Association with Giant Baba and uh, Antonio Inoki were both uh, members of, a part of, and Antonio Inoki goes on his own and forms the New Japan uh, Pro Wrestling Company, which is still extremely um, expense, uh, exp uh, still uh, relevant and in business today. Um, here he is uh, on his first world heavyweight championship belt. He wrestled uh, Carl Gotch and wrestled Gotch for his, um, which is known as the Real World Heavyweight Championship belt, which was Gotch's catch wrestling title that he had won sometime in the 60s. And they used that as the New Japan Pro Wrestling's first major world championship in the governing body of New Japan. <clears throat> that would get changed later on, and we'll explain that in a few minutes. Also in 1972 was the uh, lifting of the ban of masked wrestlers in Madison Square Garden, and here, which was a ridiculous 
um, rule, a, a band to have. I mean, come on. Uh, this is the spoiler down the bottom. The spoiler always wore a mask. Uh, he wanted to come to New York and challenge for Pedro's world title. He had to be re had to remove the mask in order to do so. So he agreed to do so. And uh, but when it came to Mascaris, just some months later, the ban was lifted. That's how hot uh, Mill Mascaris was. Uh, everyone wanted to see him. He was on the cover of almost every single magazine. Competitive right there with Bruno was many magazine covers, probably more so. Um, Mil Mascaris, for an independent wrestler by and large, uh, was a ton of magazine covers. And here is a photo of his first match in the garden against the spoiler. It's also signed by Mil Mascaris, April of 1973, Wrestling World, the night the band was lifted. <clears throat> Mascaris being the first masked wrestler. Um, El Olimpico, as a, if, that's, if that's correct, you'll see him. This was in December, and in November, El Olimpico wrestled, and he wore a mask that was more like a like an old pilot cap that covered his forehead down to his ears, like something Snoopy would wear, and uh, his face was open. Uh, so what's the point of even wearing the mask? Um, but he, you know, mask wrestlers in Mexico are extremely important and extremely, uh, you know, they, they stick very loyal to that. And I guess he did it the best he could. It's just a shame. You know, one month later, the ban was lifted. He could have made his appearance here uh, with the mask on. Um, this is a program uh, of the night Mascaris wrestled uh, for the opening night from the ban. And it was December 18th. And this is uh, also got Pedro taking on, I think, Don Leo at the time. Uh, Mascaris is on the back of the program being billed as America's uh, champion at the time, which I don't believe he was. I believe he had just lost the title, America's title, before he came over to New York. Um, but nonetheless, you know, fans in the Northeast are getting their first look at the great Mill Mascaris on December 18th. <clears throat> Take a look now at the champions. We've seen them in 1971. Now in 1972, yearbook, we are looking at the three world champions now again. And Dory Funk Jr., uh, the NWA champion, Pedro Morales, the WWWF, and Vern Gagne still as the AWA heavyweight champion. 1973, moving along, gets a title change in the NWA, and it would be Harley Race taking the NWA World Heavyweight Championship from Dory Funk Jr. And um, if, you, if you blink your eye for a second, you will miss it in the American issues. The Japanese covered a fantastic in this August 73 issue of Gong, separate volume. And it's got a poster of Harley after winning the title, not with the belt though, which is sucky, but nonetheless, uh, they show Harley and they honor him the way he should have been in his own country. Um, but all full color shots of Harley's win in this issue. Uh, Harley would be the last person to hold the crowned jewel uh, per se legitimately. You do see a photo with uh, Jack Briscoe uh, wearing that belt uh, just while Harley's belt was, uh, or Jack's belt was getting uh, his name plated to it, but um, he never held that belt. Uh, it's a long story. I, can, I think I explain that in, in another video. But uh, here's your last look at the uh, crowned jewel of both men on the cover, now Harley as the champion. <clears throat> Bruno San Martino, like I said, had lost the title in the WWF and is making his tour through WWA, NWA, and all points in between Japan. Uh, he would challenge Harley Race for the NWA world title. Many people don't know that match had ever happened, and it's right in front of our faces on the cover of Inside Wrestling, September 1973. Harley and Bruno for the NWA title. I got this one signed by both men as well. Great magazine cover. <clears throat> also, one of the probably my favorite match of all time, um, and I believe that any wrestling person who wants to become a professional wrestler, uh, any every wrestling school should show this match if they have it on video to the students who want to become a wrestler to learn how to wrestle. Uh, what a match this was to me. I haven't watched it in many years because I don't want to spoil it and I don't want it to get old. Uh, I really need to watch it now. It's probably been 10 years since I watched it. Um, but it was um, the Destroyer, who is the uh, United States uh, heavyweight champion, all Japan's uh, title. So this is a title defended in all Japan. It's the United States Heavyweight Championship belt. 
and it's held by uh, the destroyer. <clears throat> Only a few people would beat the destroyer to get that belt. One of them would have been, would be Mil Mascaris. It wouldn't be until 1978 though, but uh, it was a huge match. Uh, this is Gong, November 1973, uh, covering the match. Uh, this isn't the match on the cover, it's just showing those two wrestlers and talking about the match that's coming. They had a big series of matches throughout, but it was the October, um, oh jeez, uh, it was near my birthday, so it was either the 7th, the 9th, or the 15th, I can't remember the exact date. Um, I'll put it in the comments if anyone's interested in finding it, because I know it was on YouTube a long time ago. 1973, October, Mascaris versus uh, Destroyer. And uh, another one building up that match. <clears throat> Here is the actual match. You can tell because he's wearing, Mascaris is wearing the phantom mask. You see the white, I'm calling it phantom because that's what the Japanese were calling it. And I don't know what to call it because I've never seen that mask before. This issue of uh, Pro Wrestling Monthly has fantastic color photos inside and also a poster inside of that match. But it wasn't until Gong had covered it in November of 73 they have an entire issue dedicated to just that match. Uh, that's how big and important and how spectacular at this time period this match was. Um, the Japanese people loved it. Uh, it was match of the year in Japan. And like I said, it, I never heard of one match getting its entire magazine f dedicated to it. Uh, every page is about that match. The, the matches towards the back of the issue uh, go into the other matches that the, he had with uh, the destroyer at the time. It was a uh, two out of three fall matchup. And like I said, great mat wrestling. They were both uh, faces, they weren't ba uh, heels, and it was a very scientific match. And I just really thoroughly enjoy that as being my personal favorite. And to have a magazine dedicated to it, I've never heard of any magazine publication having covered just one match in my life. So that's definitely a rarity. 1973 would bring uh, Vern Gagne to the cover of Monthly showing his Madison Square Garden uh, debut, uh, which would be in 1972 by the time the magazine had came out. Uh, Ganya and Morales at the Garden on the cover of Monthly. But there was something interesting inside that if you look here, um, Magnificent Morocco uh, and Lonnie Kealoa, if you look closely at the tag team partner, uh, Lonnie Leah uh, Kealoa was Superfly Jimmy Snuka. So here is Don Morocco and Jimmy Snuka as tag team partners when they first started out. And they're talking about uh, the rookie sensations of the two wrestlers have a bright future ahead. And it was before he went by Superfly Jimmy Snuka there. So one other thing I love about these old magazines, especially like, you know, Wrestling Monthly, Wrestling Guide, um, ones like that, uh, Complete Wrestling, they cover matches and places the other magazines didn't go. They weren't afraid to list uh, smaller companies, smaller venues and shows and show you upcoming stars. Um, at the time, we thought these magazines sucked. Looking back at them, uh, the information and the history in these issues, offbeat issues as I call them, uh, were priceless. Uh, they, they were fantastic for reasons like that. I've learned so much more in those issues than I did in any of the Stanley Weston issues um, that you know got no, none of the praise whatsoever. <clears throat> PWI Awards um, started in Wrestling Annual, which was a victory sports series by Stanley Weston. So long before PWI was even a thing, the award issues were started in the uh, annual 1973 issue number four, which is written on the side for the 1972 um, awards. So 1972's awards are given out in this issue, which would come out in probably March, like the PWI issues came out in March. And uh, this is issue number one for your awards. Uh, Wrestling Annual will cover it a couple of years. I think um, also um, yearbook. I do a complete video on the PWI awards too. If you're a collector of those, I show you the first maybe 15 or so. <clears throat> Harley Race now, as we've seen earlier, would get the uh, 
chrome, uh, the uh, crown jewel belt, uh, he would also be the first person uh, to wear the 10 pounds of gold. And this is its first appearance, making its first appearance in 1973 is the 10 pounds of gold. And you'll notice that the 10 pounds of gold is in red. This is uh, quite different than today's, which is still going strong today, though, you know, the NWA isn't anywhere near uh, as what it once was. Uh, it's still the NWA, and that belt is still here, and it's still a prestigious title. Nonetheless, Harley Race would be the first person to uh, hold the uh, red. Jack Briscoe <clears throat> would be the new champion in 1973. He'd be the first person to win uh, the 10 pounds of gold from Harley Race. This one is also covered in Gong uh, 1973 September issue. <clears throat> Jack would go on many covers with the red. Uh, I'm just gonna show a couple of them here today. This is an invitation to the ring, February of 1974. Here's an interesting photo um, of all three uh, prior champions. Uh, Funk lost at the race, race lost it to Briscoe, and here's all three of them on the cover, posing with that belt uh, at the end of one of the matches here on the front cover of Gong, March 1974. I think this is the one that has a poster of all three. <clears throat> Let me see. Um, yeah, uh, there's just a poster here with all three guys together. I can show it to you real quick without ripping it. Um, like I said, the Japanese do a great job giving their fans great stuff. And here is just another trifold poster of Jack with the belt. I can't get the whole thing in there, but you get the idea, right? Great stuff uh, with the Japanese gave. And um, just some other shots of Jack with the trophies and some of the matches here from him in Japan. <clears throat> uh, and finally, probably... One of the sharpest looking magazine covers that come out of the 70s is just a plain red background. Jack Briscoe, March of 75 in Monthly Pro. Just a great looking shot. It really captures uh, the belt well. It pops out wonderful. Moving on through 73. Now as a look back again at who is the world champions. And November 73 Wrestling Review, Jack Briscoe with the 10 pounds of gold, although not in color, so the American fans don't get to see this yet. They don't get to see it at all. Maybe one other issue in, in Inside Wrestling, maybe. Um, Vern Gagne as the AWA and Pedro still with the WWF. <clears throat> Back in the fold now for 1974. Uh, is Bruno San Martino and Bruno recaptures the title in 74, making him a two-time Worldwide Wrestling Federation champion. And no one has ever won the WWF title twice. Bruno was the first. And um, this is Ben Strong's issue of July 74. Inside Wrestling's issue, uh, also covering it of May 74. And uh, this is also signed by Bobby Heenan, Jimmy Valiant, Terry Funk and Bruno on the cover. Great looking cover. The Japanese uh, also covered it. Phenomenal, great looking shot of Bruno getting the entire cover. And the title, it says the title goes from, uh, from Pedro to Stasiak to Bruno. And there is a picture of the former champion. Some great color photos inside of Bruno winning the title back. 1970 would see a company called the NWF pop-up from Pedro Martinez's co uh, company. And it was a great company. I thought they had some great uh, wrestling. They had some great wrestlers. And um, uh, several men went on to hold that title. Johnny Valentine, uh, Johnny Powers, um, Abdul the Butcher was the champion. Um, uh, Waldo Von Erich. Uh, there's a list of, of many people. Powers would uh, be the first champion to get notoriety uh, on the cover for that company on, on Wrestling Review. And here's a shot of Powers uh, on the cover. Here's just a couple shots of uh, future champions later on. Waldo Von Erich would hold the NWF title. They were based out of upstate New York. They covered, uh, I believe, uh, somewhere in not Detroit, Cleveland, um, Central Pennsylvania, Northern Pennsylvania, New York, Northern New York. Um, it was uh, some great matches. Also another shot of Waldo again. Um, 
Ernie Ladd would also be the title holder. Ernie Ladd's on the cover, not with the belt, but Ernie Ladd wins the NWF crown along with uh, Brisk um, Funk holding the uh, NWA title in October of 1972. Pretty much not a whole lot of coverage or mention was was uh, talked about with the NWF. And it was, it was a very good company. It was a very good uh, wrestlers. Uh, one of their bigger shows was in Cleveland, which is the Battle of the Johns, Valentine, Johnny Valentine versus uh, Johnny Powers. Johnny Valentine uh, would win the title from Powers. This issue is in uh, January of 1973. Uh, an outdoor uh, event of Wrestling Review has the full coverage of it. <clears throat> and Powers would get the title back. Um, saying this because Powers would have a match against Antonio Inoki, who is his new company, New Japan Pro Wrestling. And Antonio Inoki would win the NWF title from Powers, and he would also take ownership of the NWF and the NWF rights, and their world championship belt would now be a permanent mainstay in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And uh, here is your first look of Antonio Inoki on the cover after winning the NWF title. And uh, here is two ticket stubs. Uh, actually, the ticket, the ticket stub was ripped off with the seating um, for the match. This is the belt. This is with Powers. Uh, and this is also um, uh, Powers, another t seating section for a different ticket. Um, but it shows the North American uh, heavyweight championship. So it's the NWF North American title was being defended that night. And I believe Sagaguchi may have won that one. And um, uh, the, the main uh, world title would be Inoki and also uh, Powers. On the bottom here is Inoki defending his title against Tiger Jeet Singh. Tiger Jeet Singh would be the only other man to defeat Antonio Inoki for that title in the 70s. And here's a great shot of uh, Tiger Jeet Singh with his first world championship and goes down in the record books uh, in Japan as the heavyweight champion. Um, one other person would win that, Stan Hansen, and that was in 1982. And nobody else would carry that title. It was uh, a mainstay to Inoki. And eventually that would get blended into the, uh, the IWGP heavyweight championship that is defended today. Uh, the lineage traces right back to the NWF. Also in 1970, uh, five is the coverage of the Giant Baba winning the NWA world title. It's in a black and white photo. It's very kind of small to see. Um, Baba beats Jack Briscoe uh, for the NWA uh, world championship. Exclusive coverage is only here in the wrestler June of 75. And Giant Baba has a photo album uh, F made for him uh, as winning the heavyweight championship. He would end up two, I think three times he won the uh, NWA uh, world title um, throughout the 70s. Um, this is, I'm trying to find it. There's no date on this one. This is just a photo album number eight uh, and it's dedicated to the giant Baba. There's ones with Maskers. There's ones for Funk, Bob Backlund, uh, Anoki. The list goes on of people who get their own um, photo album and this is the Baba's photo album here. <clears throat> Another war in 1975 and 74, for that matter, when it started the Battle of Detroit, and that would be the Sheik taking on Dick the Bruiser, and that would be a bloody war that left buckets of blood in the streets of Detroit, Indianapolis, and all through the surrounding territory uh, fighting for uh, the, the better company, Dick the Bruiser or uh, the Sheik's big time wrestling. And not many magazines covered that war. Uh, the Japanese covered it tremendously. The off magazines, as I call them, this one in particular, official wrestling, Mega 75 puts it on the front cover. Bloody, bloody wars between the Sheik and Dick the Bruiser. Um, come uh, Wrestling Guide, April 75. Again, not so appealing cover. The Sheik, Dick the Bruiser, and a bloody match uh, documenting their bloody uh, rival in the, in the early to mid 70s. Um, did not, like I said, get much coverage, but it was a, uh, the history of these two having the war for promotions uh, is unprecedented. This is winter of 74, Sheik throwing fire in the direction of Ernie Ladd and uh, Dick the Bruiser on the bottom here. The Japanese, like I said, covered a great and the cover of Gong Invitation to the Ring um, in November of 74 with a bloody shot of both guys taking on their battle 
in Detroit. And finally, just a little bit of mention on the bottom of one of our Western issues, March of 75, is uh, the Sheik versus uh, Dick the Bruiser. And it's just a small little corner pick of that great bloody battle. Bruno gets the main uh, f uh, cover shot in a bloodbath in the garden. So we mentioned uh, the opening and then the closing when um, Powers sold the rights or the NWF right bought the uh, rights out to in Japan for Antonio Inoki is now defended in Japan. Another company comes up in its in its uh, ashes, and that would be the IWA, IWA uh, International Wrestling Association, and their first champion would be Mil Mascaris. This was. Again, I thought it was a fantastic company. They had TV programming uh, throughout the Northeast and down South in the Carolina, I believe. Um, great television, it reeks of the 70s. I mean, it's just, it just dripping 70s when you watch their TV episodes. There's gotta be some on YouTube. If you look up IWA, Mil Mascaris, I'm sure you'll find a ton of it. Um, wonderful programming from the 70s, great matchups, just TV matchups, squash matches, but nonetheless. Um, it, it was some great stuff, and I I, I grab anything I can from the IWA. And stuff is very very difficult to, to buy and find, uh, but there is stuff out there. Here is a an original uh, promotional photo of the Mongols, and it says the IWA Tag Team Champions, along with Crybaby Cannon as their manager. Um, these old uh, promos are difficult to find. This is. Um, Signed eight by ten of of one of the Mongols who was uh, the mass superstar uh, Beppo uh, Mongol and with the titles um, Bulldog Brower was their North American heavyweight champion and if you look at the belt it's the same as the United States looking belt from the Sheik or also in the Crockett territory um, but he was the uh, the champion Ox Baker was also the champion there um, here is just a uh, a lineup sheet from a match that they had in Miami, Florida, and the back of the uh, photo uh, is a Mascaris on the promotional side. <clears throat> that went on, you know, it lasted a handful of years, a little bit less than a handful, I should say. Uh, Mascaris never lost a title. He was on many covers uh, as the champion. This is another one, May 77, with Mascaris. Another one with just a beautiful looking belt there uh, of Mascaris in November 76. He makes a Japanese appearance on a cover with that belt. Great shot of Mill on the cover of Gong, 1976, January. Uh, we've seen this now in, in several videos. Here is a program. To one of their bigger shows, uh, Mascaris defends the title against Ivan Koloff, and this is a magazine program to that event that took place uh, in New Jersey in 1975. Here is the actual program with the date, uh, July 10th, 1975 at Roosevelt Stadium. Uh, this is also signed by Mascaris. <clears throat> and the Japanese put out an awesome poster that I took out of the magazine uh, of that match. And it's hard to fit it in here, all of it. But uh, it poured rain that night. If you look closely, you can see the rain speckle here from the match. Just a great Sports Illustrated quality photo um, of the match for the heavyweight title. Ivan Koloff versus Mil Mascaris. Just, I have that poster hanging uh, in my room. I thought it's an awesome shot. <clears throat> Moving up through 1975, we got our first mention of a wrestler who really did not get the credit he deserved. Uh, the 70s sensation uh, up through the early part of the 80s was Mr. Wrestling 2. Uh, here's your first look at Mr. Wrestling 2 in uh, issue number 14, uh, 1975 yearbook. And Mr. Wrestler, uh, Mr. Wrestling 2 uh, got Wrestler of the Year. So this is the yearbook issue I was telling you before about when they changed uh, from PWI awards. And this now is in the yearbook edition. So hunting these down can be difficult. I think this is the third installment. Yeah, this is the third uh, issue that has covered the um, award issues. And Mr. Wrestling 2, who uh, got Wrestler of the Year. <clears throat> and he was not on very many covers. And it was a tremendous wrestler, extremely popular, well loved throughout the Carolinas and Georgia area. Uh, wrestling too was was the shit, and he tr made a short trip up north here in New York. 
made it on one, maybe two TV tapings, and I uh, was gone and never seen him again, and it's a shame. Um, this is a July issue of The Wrestler with a full shot of Mr. Wrestling 2 on the cover. Great shot of him. And by and large, you're going to see him on a smaller sections, uh, a corner of shots. Uh, this is uh, July of 76, The Wrestler, and Mr. Wrestling 2 there. Mr. Wrestling 2 here seems to be in traction. Um, I remember one of the magazines, it's got him swimming and him uh, grilling in the backyard at, at the grill, and then he's uh, playing with his kids in the yard, and he's wearing the mask the whole time. I mean, He's like splitting firewood with the mask on. <laughs> it's ridiculous. But uh, it's just funny photos that you see with the wrestlers um, in the 70s there. They just captured some of that great stuff that we just don't see anymore. Um, here's a really rare shot. I think the uh, Destroyer may have done it once. Uh, a bloodied shot with the mask on. Uh, great concept, especially with a white mask. Uh, him taking on uh, Dick Slater here. And this is on the cover of one of the Superstars' uh, covers of August of 77. Mr. Wrestling 2 went on to have a couple of uh, brutal battles with Terry Funk. They're on several magazine covers together, him and Funk. And uh, this is spring of 1977 yearbook. I'm trying to, sorry, the glare is killing me. I know. But, <clears throat> um, two, once again, on the cover uh, with the title. I'm not sure which title he would be having at this point. Um, summer of 77. It's probably somewhere in Georgia, I would believe. Uh, he was big in the Mid-South area. He was responsible for giving Magnum TA his, his kickoff. Um, he was extremely popular and then turned on Magnum and became a heel. <clears throat> There's uh, two, uh, one, one more time uh, on the cover of Wrestling Picture Book. And here he is battling with Ernie Ladd uh, on the cover of The Wrestler, July 79. And once again with, I believe it's Terry Funk here. Yes, Terry Funk, November 79, Wrestling's Greatest Battles. And I believe this is the final issue of Wrestling's Greatest Battles, a difficult issue to find, or at least it used to be at one time. Um, I, again, Mr. Wrestling 2 was, was a phenomenal wrestler, taking the place of Mr. Wrestling 1, and he just does not, in my opinion, get enough credit for being the great wrestler that he was. <clears throat> it's a shame we didn't get to see him here in the Northeast more often. 76, 1976 was also the birth of the feud between Superstar Graham and Dusty Rhodes, and they would battle for the Florida Heavyweight Championship. They would battle for the WWF Heavyweight Championship and all points in between with, you name it, they did it. Uh, a strap match, bull rope match, uh, a Texas tornado match, death match, whatever, you can, whatever you want to call them, they had matches, and these guys did it all over the country and were extremely successful with it. Um, here's an early shot of a strap match, superstar challenging uh, Dusty Rhodes uh, in, the, in Florida, uh, probably most likely for the title, uh, early 76. Another shot of a rare magazine, Wrestling Training. I do a video on Wrestling Training because this is another magazine that really doesn't get much credit. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was a fantastic magazine. Uh, thick, heavy, glossy paper. Um, it's, I, I wish it stayed around more. It geared a lot towards the bigger, muscled up guys because it was a muscle guy who ran the magazine. I explain all that in another vid. Definitely check out Wrestling Training Illustrated if you don't have any of those. You'll like them. <clears throat> um, the wrestler picking up the feud with Superstar and Dusty. Superstar and Dusty on the wrestler February 78, getting the life choked out of him, which led on to the bull rope matches. Andre the Giant now on the cover as the referee. This would be covered, I believe, in the rise of Dusty Rhodes' video I did, or maybe the Florida video that I did. Uh, I'm not sure which one. It goes into deep uh, conversation about Dusty and Superstar. So check out those videos back in our library. And there's just a couple of more uh, Dusty Rhodes with the WWF title at the end, uh, thinking that he won the belt. <clears throat> Another cowbell shot, Superstar and Dusty in January of 79. And this would go on through the 80s after Superstar has already left uh, the wrestling business for a while to try out for the strongman competitions in the early 80, 81, 82. And this is winter 81 <clears throat> and Best of the Wrestler got another cowbell shot. Uh, because they were still extremely popular and selling out magazines every time they were on the cover. <clears throat> Another big thing to happen in the 76 uh, uh, circa was Bruno Sammartino getting his neck broken 
against uh, Stan Hansen, and that led on to the second Shea Stadium spectacular. Here's a cover shot of Bruno with the broken neck, and if anyone thought wrestling was fake, and then you see this kind of a photo and a cover, and you're like, oh my God, you know, Bruno is hurt, and they see him with the neck brace, and it really brings things in its proper perspective, you know, the illusion, I should say, anyway, right? Um, but this is uh, August of 76, The Wrestler, <clears throat> and covering some of the match and the rematch, the several matches that they had afterwards, uh, would be Popular Wrestling, February 1977. Also, uh, Dusty Rhodes with the Florida title here in the corner uh, of the magazine, another rare shot of him. Um, the uh, match in a cage with Stan Hansen and Bruno is covered in March, I'm sorry, November of 76, The Wrestler, and it's covered here in the film strip kind of cover here. They've done that several times over the years. I never liked it. It's not very standout-ish, and you don't, it doesn't capture your eye as much as, say, a front bloody cover would. You can easily overlook this and not even know it was there. They did the same thing for Harley Race's NWA title win when he won the title for the first time, and I hated it. It covered Harley here with uh, winning the title, and it was just terrible coverage. Um, this is a much better coverage of this wrestlers issue September 76 and this was at Shea Stadium where the 50,000 fans cheer uh, as Bruno uh, makes the greatest comeback in history and uh, great shot of Bruno uh, too bad my only regret is not having Bruno sign this one <clears throat> also was the Anoki and Ali match which you know many people say was a flop it was horrendous it was this it was that uh, it was a real match, and uh, Anoki went into it, and he challenged a boxer for real. I, I give him props for that. Um, as much of a bore as it was, it took a lot of balls to do what he did. <clears throat> 76 uh, would also see the debut of Madison Square Garden for uh, uh, Bruiser Brody, and his debut of a magazine cover would be January 77, The Wrestler in the match uh, with Bruno in a, a Texas death style match as it's being uh, written on the cover. Early shot of Bruiser Brody here uh, getting his head into the ropes. Um, 76 would also see a title change. Jack Briscoe losing the title to Terry Funk. And then it wouldn't be until 77 um, we would get the magazine cover of Funk with the uh, championship belt. Also Mr. Wrestling uh, being mentioned on the side here and uh, great shot of Terry Funk very 70s looking uh, cover this is February 77 inside wrestling <clears throat> the wrestle um, wrestling news uh, also covered it uh, Funk uh, has already lost the title by this point but nonetheless they're showing him uh, in 79 March February March issue of wrestling news Funk with the leopard skin there that's also very 70s of uh, with the NWA title <clears throat> Um, champions for 1976, hello Jimi Hendrix, beat it bud. Um, 1976 yearbook is uh, Bruno, uh, Terry Funk, and now Nick Bockwinkel is the champion. He defeated uh, Vern Gagne, and Jimmy's making another appearance. Get out of here, pal. Um, he beat Vern Gagne in 75 for the title. Hardly any coverage, nothing on a magazine cover for him. Maybe something across the top of one of the issues, but you know, you blink your eye, you're going to miss that as well. Um, but these are now the three champions of 76. <clears throat> Late 76, December, I believe, to be exact, Superstar Graham would make his Madison Square Garden debut against Bruno San Martino, and they would have an epic battle, uh, both at the uh, Meadowlands Arena and at the Madison Square Garden. Uh, here's a cover shot of the two in 76. <clears throat> Same match, different magazine, uh, later year, a later month rather, that was May, this is April. Um, uh, April 1976, The Wrestler to be exact, and August, come on Jim, beat it dude. August 1977, uh, Superstar Graham does the unthinkable and defeats Bruno San Martino and wins the Worldwide Wrestling Federation heavyweight championship uh, great looking shot of superstar here uh, taking the title from bruno and that would be the end of bruno uh, as we knew it as world champ you got to get out of here come on <clears throat> bruno once again on the cover uh with superstar they would be on a tremendous amount of covers and uh superstars boasting their belt looks good around my waist superstar now for more in deep 
detail superstar check out the superstar Graham video that we did it covers all his matches and all the uh covers that he was on this is probably my favorite of all the superstar covers september of 1977 take my belt you'll have to kill me first <clears throat> another shot of superstar as champ a couple more now just showing off the great looking physique of superstar continuing the battle it out in 79's issue of inside wrestling january with bruno September, uh, November of 77, a bloodied shot of the two men. This is when Bruno had um, a gorilla monsoon as the uh, referee and they stopped there for the blood. Uh, Superstar again posing uh, on the cover, great looking shot of him flexing. Uh, Terry Funk would drop the title to Harley Race and now first time holding uh, and using the black NWA World Championship belt. Great looking cover on Monthly Pro Wrestling, uh, April of 1977. <clears throat> Setting up the two new champions to face off in a Super Bowl of wrestling. And this is well documented throughout several of our videos. Check out the Harley video or the Superstar Graham for that. Maybe even Florida, I mentioned it, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, Superstar Graham would face Harley Race for a title versus title, and this is covered in the 78 issue of Sports Review Fall Annual. It's also covered incredibly on this cover of Superstar and Harley, um, May of 70, uh, 78, Sports Review, another one of my favorite covers of just posing with the belts. You gotta love the belt shot covers. You gotta love photos like this. You just don't see a cover like this Ever since, I don't know, 86 and up, they stopped going with this kind of a look. And what a, what a crime, because there were some of the best magazine covers where it's just two guys standing there or just two guys wrestling like this. And this is a great shot of the match. Harley and Superstar, Superstar a bloody mess during their 78 match in Florida. Uh, in 77, here's a new look at our new world champions of all three champions, Nick Bockwinkle, AWA, NWA, Harley Race, and now Superstar showing off for the first time in the champion collage covers. Bob Backlund was waiting in the wings to take the title from Superstar Graham some nine months later, I believe it was. And here's Bob's first look at him as champion uh, with the belt after winning the match. I think all of these of Bob or in my signed collection. Um, yeah, uh, great covers of Bob. He looked great with the belt on. He was a terrific wrestler. He didn't fit the mold too much for the New York fans, but go back and give him another look. Check him out one more time uh, and see what a, a good wrestler he was in comparison, especially to today's garbage. Um, he's well missed. Uh, any kind of a wrestler like that is well missed. Um, the guy had some wars. He had some wars with some of the biggest, baddest guys out there, and he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them to entertain us the best he could. Uh, his first match out of the gate defending the title was against Harley Race for the NWA title. It was supposed to be Superstar Graham in a rematch, and Backlund won the title. Now Harley takes on Backlund title versus title, another match that's not very much talked about. <clears throat> he would also have a four-time repeat month, uh, I believe it was October, or September, October, November, and December, back to back to back to back against Pat Patterson, Intercontinental Champion versus the WWF Champion, and uh, uh, what a war they were! Finally, ending in a in a cage match, uh, bloody battles. Bob bled a ton. I think Bob Backlund, the All American Boy, this and that. Uh, he had some bloody battles. Here's another bloody cover of him on the cover of Wrestling Today, 1979. Another bloody match of him uh, in February of 1980. Backlund, a great shot of him in a bloody face and holding up uh, the title. And now our new champions for 1978 is covered uh, well on a, trying to get everybody in the shot here, it's hard to get it. Uh, the wrestling uh, photo, championship wrestling photo album, USA, um, Harley Race, the NWA, Nick Bockwinkle, AWA and now Bob Backlund, the WWF champion, 1978 from Japan. Fantastic photo album this is. If you haven't ever seen it, I, you know what, it's, I can't believe it's an hour and 20. I'll show you guys another time. Great full color 
awesome photos of everyone uh, that you could think of. It's in that thick magazine. If you see one, try to track one down. They're ex very expensive, but they're well worth it if you're a collector. Um, 1978 would also see the birth of the feud of Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair. And uh, that match goes back beyond 78, but the first time it's on a cover uh, is, is being exposed to the world uh, as a front cover. Inside Wrestling, February 1978, Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair. Ric Flair will make his first appearance on a magazine in 76, um, starting his uh, future was bright from that point on, and he would be on the most magazine covers of like almost anybody besides Hogan later on. Uh, another uh, cover, December of 78, uh, Dusty and, uh, and Flair, once again, you know, Inside Wrestling. Uh, April of 1979, Inside Wrestling, again, Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair. <clears throat> and I'm going to show you this issue here. I've shown it once before, but I think it's good to bring it up again. Dusty's uh, feud and Flair began in 1975 in Florida, and uh, here's just some great bloody shots of early on Ric Flair taking on Dusty Rhodes trying to get everything in there um, here's a really early shot of Flair as the champion the bottom uh, it translates uh, Atlantic Coast heavyweight champion Ric Flair at the bottom um, I think they mean like mid-Atlantic and here's another great color shot uh, of Flair getting the elbow from Dusty Rhodes and you take notice uh, Flair's boots with the stripes yep that's the ones uh, this is on this issue of July 1975 um, Pro Wrestling Monthly, another difficult issue to find, but I thought it was worth pointing out uh, the full color shot of those two starting their feud in 1975, which that feud would continue on throughout the 80s, as we all know, uh, main, mainlining the uh, Star Arcade 85 event and then Bash 86 event and so on. Uh, their, their feud would go on for uh, another 15 years of, of blood and guts. Um, Flair would also have incredible matches with his former partner blackjack mulligan and here that here they are on the front cover and if you look and you would think it might have been superstar graham because you see a thick guy with blonde hair and bloodied and it's not rick flair it's 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 uh, it's not superstar graham i mean it's rick flair it kind of looks like superstar graham november of 78 the wrestler and it, it's showing the feud that these two uh, had in the carolinas <clears throat> another shot of it on best of the wrestler and uh just a great early shot of 70s flair there with his hair real long and flapping um the Sports Review of 79 is covering their cage match uh, that they had, Flair and Mulligan, both a bloody mess. That would have been a great front cover. Too bad they didn't make that a, a bigger shot. Um, but Flair had some serious wars uh, in the 70s, <clears throat> one of which would become his most popular. Uh, here's Flair as the United States champion uh, in the Crockett territory in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, he would begin his feud with Ricky Steamboat, who was also a young and up-and-coming wrestler. This will be his first magazine cover in 1979, and it's as the United States champion. Him and Ric Flair would begin that feud, another shot of Flair, uh, in the, uh, in the mid-70s, in 1977. Here is a shot of uh, Flair and Steamboat on their first cover together. And it's just a great shot of those two. And what a war that would continue on throughout the rest of the 70s, throughout the 80s, up to 94. I can name the matches that were on a pay-per-view. I think that was Spring Stampede 94. I mean, it wasn't the same as it was, but it was, you know, it's still Flair and Steamboat. And they would, you know, go on for uh, several different decades battling it out with each other. And here's another uh, rare, great shot of a young Steamboat bloodied up. You don't see Steamboat bleed too often. I got a good bloody magazine with Steamboat and the Sheik, and, and one of the people on the channel mentions it in the in the uh, comments, and I'm like, geez, yeah, I would like to have seen that match, and lo and behold, I have a magazine that's covering that match, and, and Steamboat's a bloody mess. Uh, you didn't see him bleed very often, and uh, that was I should have showed that magazine. I'll show it another time, uh, but thanks to one of you guys for pointing it out to me, and then I found it, that I do actually have it. Um, here's another shot, Flair and Steamboat. Flair now is a 
bloody mess. His whole blonde hair is nothing but red. Uh, this is the cover of Sports Review, May 79. <clears throat> and getting the best cover, August of 1979, The Wrestler. And uh, it's just got uh, Steamboat and Flair. Um, will, their, will their feud end their careers? And uh, just a great looking magazine cover from the 70s. Also in 1979, Dusty Rhodes would take the World Heavyweight Championship from Harley Race. And uh, here's your shot of Dusty uh, on the cover on the wrestling uh, Victory Sports Annual 1980, although he didn't hold it in 80. And here is a cover of a, a Grapevine Program magazine. Uh, Dusty wins the world title. Great looking shot of Dusty taking it. Uh, coverage of the match in December 79 of inside wrestling and but he wouldn't hold it for very long uh, just a few short days later uh, Harley race was waiting in the wings and the title goes from Rhodes to race uh, um, uh, within I forget how many days it was it may have been a week or so December 79's uh, issue of inside wrestling covering it and here's Harley uh, getting the championship back this is January of 80's issue, but the match took place in 79. Also taking place in 79, Bob Backlund uh, taking on The Sheik. And uh, we cover this well in a couple of other videos with the Bob Backlund uh, holding uh, The Sheik's uh, championship belt and those full color photos that we had. There were some great pics in there. <clears throat> I forget what video that one's in though. Uh, also winning the WWF title would be Antonio Inoki winning the title in Japan and uh, I'm not sure if it's recognized by McMahon or not. I really don't care if it's recognized by McMahon or not. Antonio Inoki won the World Wrestling Federation title. He pinned Bob Backlund in the ring and here he is on the cover of this magazine showing it off. <clears throat> you know, it's funny, there, there was a thing that um, like oh, the WWF or the WWE, it says, doesn't recognize Harley as an eight-time world champion. Who the fuck cares what you what you uh, acknowledge or, or who are you to even comment on it? Has nothing to do with you. Has nothing to do with the WWF, WWE, Vince McMahon. Nothing. That would be like me saying, you know, I don't I don't uh, recognize uh, uh, Joe Frazier was the world champion. Well, it doesn't matter if I recognize it or not. He was the world champion. Uh, Anoki was the world champion of the WWF, and he should be getting credit for it because he was legitimately the champ. He was also become the WWF's first martial arts champion. Um, I, again, I show all that kind of stuff uh, in the Inoki videos that we showed. Um, this is uh, the champions now of 79, although it being short, because Dusty held it for very short, we got him on the cover of um, Wrestling Superstars with Bachwinkle, Backlund, and Dusty Rhodes as the champ. But it would go right back to Harley Race by the end of 79. And uh, the ring, the rings, not the ring, the rings, which was different. Uh, we I explained that in the rings video. Check that out for some mass confusion. November of 1979, all three champions, Bob Backlund, who would challenge uh, Nick Bockwinkle for the AWA title in 79, and Harley Race, uh, all on the cover of the three world heavyweight champions together. Great looking magazine cover, probably one of the best ones for the ring slash rings uh, publication. Uh, great looking shot of it all. <clears throat> now, I have, this is... Um, I have a question for any of my fans out there who are still with me for an hour and 26 minutes. Holy friggin' shit. I can't believe it's that long. Sorry, guys. I had no idea this was still going on this long. My Lord. Um, if you're still with me, uh, thank you. And sorry to put you th through an hour and 30 minutes of video. My goodness. Um, I have a question, and it's been bothering me for years, and I need any of my friends out there who can identify this for me. And I'm gonna show you a series of magazines and I'm trying to identify where this building is. I have no idea where. I'm going to guess it's Canada. I have no idea why I feel that way, only because the magazine is published in Canada. I don't know for sure, it's just a guess. It looks like they're in a barn. If you look real closely, you'll see the beams and the wood shelf and the wood, I'm sorry, not the shelf, the roofing and the, and the, uh, the, the wood planking going across the top. I want to know where this is. If anyone knows where what that arena is, uh, here's another shot of it. Uh, you see it all through Wrestling Monthly's issues, Wrestling Guides issues, Complete Wrestling. Uh, I have no clue where it's at, and it 
it's been driving me crazy. You see the beams here again on the roof. Harley Race is throwing. Someone looks like Big John Studd out the window. It's not John Studd though. Um, again, you see the the wood beam background. Very low ceiling. A very small place. Um, I want to say it's in, it's in Canada. If anyone knows where this is, just please tell me in the comments. Uh, it's been baffling me for decades. <laughs> and uh, it's never written in the magazine about it. They don't say it. Um, and just always had sparked my curiosity. Again, another great shot. If any of these matches were on television, if anyone has recognizes any of these, uh, please put an end to my madness and tell me where this is from, where it's at, and what territory it is. Like I said, I don't know if it's Canada. I'm just guessing it is because they're there a lot, and this publication is out of Canada. That's the only reason I say that. All right? Drop it in the comments if anyone happens to know. <clears throat> so, in the end of 70s, uh, 879 um, we're pretty much at the end of the road we kind of covered every single magazine uh, showcasing uh, the big high points of the 70s we didn't cover everything in the 70s it's impossible I just covered some of the big title changes some of the big appearances for the first time some feuds that kicked off from the 70s uh, some of the early uh, pictures of guys who were just coming up like Steamboat and Flair uh, lesser known guys who should have gotten more popularity like Mr. Wrestling 2 I'm not saying he wasn't popular because he was huge and in, 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 uh, all over Mid-South and also uh, in Georgia. But throughout the world, uh, he, more people should have known about Mr. Wrestling too uh, and stuff like that. So uh, thanks for joining me throughout this long ass video that I did. This is probably the longest one. Um, uh, here's two of your most expensive issues that you'll find in the in the 70s. The uh, 78 annual uh, is very expensive because of the trading cards, and I discussed this in how much is that magazine worth video we did. And also, uh, Pro Wrestling Illustrated is another extremely expensive magazine. Um, it could cost you in the $100 range as well. Just make sure here it says uh, extra bonus full color pinup, and doesn't say replica version, okay? You don't want the replica because there's a fake out there and some people try to pass it off as the real one. So you don't want to spend $50, $60 on a, you know, on a magazine that's not the, the legit one. So make sure it's September 79, issue number one of PWI. <clears throat> and um, I'm just going to leave it off with possibly uh, my favorite wrestler from 1970s, the greatest champion uh, throughout the 70s. Uh, he was a man who carried the, the belt with dignity and grace and respect for the sport of professional wrestling. Uh, he's the greatest wrestler on God's green earth. Uh, he is without a doubt in my top three favorite wrestlers of all time, Harley Race. And thank you, Harley, for all the magnificent memories you had given us uh, from the 70s and also uh, in the 80s. And thank you, uh, friends of the channel, for sticking through me for an hour and 30 minute video. This is crazy. I know I haven't been active in a while. I've been very, 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 very busy with work and I promise to be more active uh, real soon. This was a lot of fun. I can't believe how long the video went and I hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you guys on the next.